I'm Jamie DeLuca, and this is my introduction to variational electrodynamics with a crash review of relativity and the no interaction theorem of 1963. If you're seeing this from the link in my CV, there is also the PDF, a link to the PDF there. Or you can stop YouTube and read. The outline is a crash review of essential details of my research from the perspective of modern mathematics, risking losing interdisciplinary viewers who are not on the same page. I include disclaimers of what variational electrodynamics is not. To warn old page originalists, for example, the construed bubble chamber application on page 19 over 23. The seminar is 23 pages plus references. I developed Epsilon Strong Variational Electrodynamics, henceforth called Epsilon VE, to model atomic systems. It took me from 1998 until 2013 to move from my helium model to a model for the hydrogen atom. Epsilon VE possesses time-reversible equations of motion in semi-flow form and reduces to electrodynamics when epsilon goes to zero. Just for the records, I will put Maxwell's equations here for E and B belonging to C1 of time and, and space. One possessing one continuous derivative in time and space. The following PDEs are called Maxwell equations. Most popular versions of electrodynamics involve singularities and velocity denominators. For example, for Maxwell's electrodynamics, Lorentz's force diverges at every point of the charge's trajectory. The popular Maxwell's equations are Gauss's law, the divergence of V equals to the charge density. Gauss's law of magnetism, divergence of V equals to zero. Faraday's law, curl of V equals to minus dBdt. Ampere Maxwell law, curl of B is current density plus dEdt. Field singularities make Lorentz's force nonsensical for Maxwell's equations. In, in variational aerodynamics, you don't have this problem, but uh, let's go on. In, uh, Mar the equation of motion in Maxwell's equation is force equals to n d d t of v of square root of 1 minus v squared is q times the Lorentz force. If you take E and B from Maxwell's equations, and use it in Maxwell's electrodynamics, E and B diverge at every point of the trajectory, which is right where you need them, and it becomes nonsensical. In this seminar, sometimes it goes without saying that the speed of light in vacuum is C equal to 1. Sometimes I forget to put. Uh, Maxwell's equations for absolutely continuous charge densities. Absolutely continuous is that thing that goes inside an integral, if you're going to integrate things. Uh, from the potential, scalar potential, vector potential, possessing two continuous derivatives in time and space, we define B as the curl of the vector potential and E as minus the ADT minus the gradient of the scalar potential. We choose units for C to be equal to 1 and choose the divergence of A by this condition, thus normalizing Maxwell's equations to a pair of wave equations, which is a wave equation for the vector potential with the, cur the current density as the inhomogeneous term, a wave equation for the scalar potential, with the charge density as the inhomogeneous term. 
in Wheeler Feynman electrodynamics, the wave equation has a sum of delta functions as the source, no? rather than absolutely continuous. But you can satisfy the Maxwell equation as well. The Leonard and Virchow solution of the wave equation with a point source of charge Q diverges at every point of the charge's trajectory. I already told you. Just important to see what the solution is for E and B. The electric field is a linear combination with the two coefficients that add to one that I write one half plus chi and one half minus chi for for chi and any real proportional to the charge and there are two vector functions of time and space the magnetic field is also a linear combination with the same coefficients of two functions vector functions b plus and b minus which are based on the light cone let me explain a bit what E plus and minus are. The plus is for the uh, future light cone and the minus is for the past light cone. The vector n in this formula is a unit vector that points from the light cone of point Tx. We'll see that soon. And you see here that there are denominators. Okay? One plus or minus the scalar product of the unit vector times the velocity. The velocity is lesser than the speed of light, which is 1 here. So whenever n scalar v is nearing 1, it must be aligned with, aligning with, with m. And then whenever this becomes a small denominator, 1 plus or minus v is a small denominator cube. Of course, v has to go to 1, and n plus v has to go to 0. So this is 0 times 0 divided by 0 cube. So this is 1 over 0 times 1 over r squared. This is in every form of electrodynamics. If somebody told you that you are supposed to guess that the velocity is small, is at your own risk. Okay? Because uh, it is there. If you think that a like long term is a just for a small velocity, that's your problem. Uh, and then you have a transverse field, which is proportional to the acceleration, and it's a triple vector product, uh, which is a unit vector n, vector n plus v, vector a, divided by the same cube denominator. Again, if you have a, an orbit which has a velocity less than the speed of light, but nearing the speed of light, and this is going to zero, this will go to zero as well, so this is zero divided by zero cubed, so this is one over zero squared, times one over the distance in light cone. And the magnetic field is transversal to E, uh, is the vector product of N times E min minus or plus. The case chi equal to zero is time reversible and it has a variational principle. It is the only case that has a variational principle, which is the base of variational electrodynamics. Now, important for mathematicians that study state dependent delay, the implicit state dependent delay of the theory of relativity. Classical mechanics operates with Newtonian locality. For example, in Newtonian gravity, the acceleration of the moon depends on the distance at the same time to Earth, which is x1 of t minus x2 of t, and i12 is the distance the, of these two coordinates measured at the same time because the speed of light is finite, if you are going to do this measuring from Earth, you must send light 
to the moon and then wait for the light to be reflected and come back using radar. And of course, when the light is coming back, the moon is moving. When the light is going in, the moon is moving. So when it comes back, you have a completely different value for x2. And for this, the theory of relativity defines Einstein locality. For a definition of a Hermann Bonny, which is the nicest, if you are studying state dependent delay, I strongly advise you should read this uh, book by Hermann Martin. It is a, Martin is a very thin book. It's in my references. No, about the radar formulas of, of Bondi. It's a beautiful way to introduce the theory of relativity using state dependent delay. Here is a crash definition. Every point of an inertial frame is equipped with a clock running synchronized with the clock at the origin of that frame. Every frame has a clock at the origin, and all the clocks have some everywhere else are synchronized with that clock. The Einstein locality condition connects points satisfying the Lycone conditions, which is T1 minus T2 is plus or minus the distance from x1 at time t1 to x2 of time t2. Here I put the speed of light. The rest is equal to 1. I forget this. The positive sign of 1 defines the future light cone, while the negative sign defines the past light cone. Equation 1 is Bondi's radar formula that you are going to read in Mark. The squared version of 1 is the state-dependent light cone condition. If you square this, you get T1 minus T2 squared equals to this squared. So it's 1 coordinate squared equals to the other 3 coordinates squared. It is the equation for a cone. And it's a state-dependent condition, which is implicit. And this is in any form of electrodynamics. Now I'm going to show you the generalization of the Wheeler-Feynman action, the Tetro, Fokker, Schwarzschild, Wheeler, and Feynman. And it was generalized by Domingo Luis Martinez in 2005. Luis Martinez passed away a few years ago. It's an action, it's a functional of the trajectories of the particles which is a local term, which is a, a simple integral. It's the kinetic energy term of the Lagrangian. And it's an integral over the Lorentz invariant uh, integration element. Then you have electrodynamics is defined by a double integral, which contains uh, uh, the two times, times the Minkowski product of the velocities, and times the delta function of the square separation, which is a Lorentz invariant. So this is a independent of the Lorentz frame. According to Martinez, you can put all, uh, three terms only. It's enough in an integral like this. If you are going to consider an integral that involves only the two point interactions, so you have this one, you have another one which is the square root, square root dt dt, and another one which is this one. Uh, I have, uh, just important to tell you that this is not an action that you have seen in your book of classical mechanics. Please, I will tell you, I will try to tell you that uh, this is uh, not a special case of, of classical mechanics, you know. If you are operating with black and white mentality, your classical or quantum, okay, this is more than quantum. Just wait a bit, I will explain to you. So, I have uh, included this epsilon because I was able to prove that electrodynamics alone is not a semi-flow. If you put epsilon non-zero, you can show that the equations of motion become a semi-flow. This term here, I haven't studied yet. I chose to put it equal to zero because it's simpler. 
and it's a kind of gravity because if you integrate, see, if you want to have one of the actions of a classical similar to your actions of classical mechanics, you can integrate by parts here, and if you integrate TP by parts, then you get an integral in, in TE, which is like your book of classical mechanics, but I would have to be careful. And then you get the partial Lagrangian for the electronic motion. If you integrate over TE, you get the partial Lagrangian for the protonic motion. They are not the same. In your book of classical mechanics, they are the same. They are not the same, okay? Here. And observations. A epsilon is unlike the actions of classical mechanics. It defines two partial actions for an infinite dimensional problem. In your book of classical mechanics, when you see electron and proton, you are going to get an ODE out of it. Here, you need segments of trajectory, and it's an infinite dimensional problem. So, more complicated than your Schrodinger equation. So, if you think that this is classical in your Schrodinger equation is fancy because somebody taught you in a later course, watch for it, okay? My semi-flow paper studied the Lorentz equivalent semi-flow of the special case when g equals to zero and epsilon is non-zero. See the link in the YouTube description. We'll get back to this. Uh, Einstein died in 1955. Then came the No Interaction Theorem, NIT, which was proved by Sudarshan in 1963. I'll give you a bunch of references at the end. I will just read the abstract quickly, put it here. A relativistically invariant classical mechanical Hamiltonian description of a system of three or more, or more particles admits no interaction between the particles if the canonical variable satisfies the Poisson bracket relations of the Lorentz group. A significant part of the proof is valid for any fixed number of particles, including two particles. Okay? In a nutshell, the only Lorentz equivalent three-body motion is a motion with constant velocities, which is a Hamiltonian of E for this Hamiltonian. P1 squared plus M1 squared, everybody knows this one. P2 squared plus M2 squared, P3 squared plus M2. If you took a mini course in physics, you will know this. Okay? The no interaction theorem institutionalized the zombie apocalypse because it came too late in the history of the 20th century. And they're already using things. Uh, and now, and when they saw the no-interaction theorem, well, ener energy and mechanics had made into every law of physics. Quantum mechanics. I mean, why are you going to bother with the uh, mechanics while you're going to quantize something which is not Lorentz invariant? And is this sensible? Uh, high energy physics. What is the energy if the only one you can have is for... Uh, three particles and moving in a, s a straight line. Statistical mechanics. Why are you going to do statistics with something which is not Lorentz invariant? E equals to mc squared. This is just a way to trans a transformation from this one when you put this, uh, forget about these two. And E equals to h omega. Are you, talk about, are you talking about this energy? Because this is the only one that is sensible for the theory of relativity. And bunch of t-shirts, and, and etc. Let me continue to be the messenger of bad news because there are people that dream that they have a theory of everything. They're out there. They say, somebody told them that with 19 parameters you make a theory of everything. Well, I will argue with you that this is not even a special case of their enormous divergent generalization. But let's, let's see. Watch that the equation like below is never part of a relativistic Hamiltonian of E for two-body motion with interaction. And this equation is the relativistic uh, variation of momentum. Unless it is the non-autonomous Hamiltonian of E for 
one body motion, it violates the no interaction theorem. So be careful if you're going to use your book in classical mechanics and uh, make sure you use it for just one particle, okay? And, the, uh, and with the given force here. It gets worse. I'll tell you why it gets worse. In the 70s, delay equations were studied with the theory of semi-flows. And let me tell you just one result of the studies. Delay equations are not all these, okay? But rather infinite dimensional problems. Okay. So if, as I already told you, if you want an ODE, the theory of relativity won't, won't give it to you for two bytes. And even worse, you won't have any kind of ODE. So without theorems, because of the finite speed of light, the motion must follow a delay equation, okay? And delay equations are not ODE, so you won't have an ODE. For time-reversible interactions in light cone, the non-ODE equation of motion is, you want to do an equation like this, and DDT of this, or you can have an equation like this, but the, it will be a function of the present position of, of one, the position of two in the charge two in the past light cone, the velocity of particle two in the past light cone, the acceleration of particle two in the past light cone, the position of particle two in the future light cone, the velocity of particle two in the future light cone, and the acceleration of particle two in the future light cone. And of course, it involves the future, so if you want to use this in an ODE, we will see that you must be able to solve for the most advanced acceleration construct your, your ODE. The bad news should serve as a warning and also perhaps to engage you to try to read all the details in my papers. Uh, let me summarize the warnings in a table about the complexity of differential equations used in modeling nature because some people seem to have forgotten that science is about modeling nature. Some are operating like science is a, generali a straight line generalization from theories that are completely impossible. So let me just say some few lines. These are three levels of complexity. First, there is the Hamiltonian for the two-particle problem. P1 squared over 2m, P2 squared over plus v. And this is to tell you that according to the no interaction theorem, you cannot turn it into P minus a squared plus m squared, P2 plus a squared plus m squared plus v. You know, even if you dreamed that a relativistic correction would still be Hamiltonian, the no interaction theorem is there to tell you that no, you won't have. So, relativistic correction will take you to an infinite dimensional delay equation right away. You can't just think that you're going to do this because you're dreaming of something which is impossible. It was proven impossible in 1963. The 20th century guesswork has landed very nice equations like minus Rb over 2 Laplacian of Psi plus V psi equals to e psi, this is an infinite dimensional problem. But let me say it is a very simple infinite dimensional problem because it is local in its infinite dimensional phase space. You're looking for a function that is sitting in some infinite dimension or usually it's infinity, so whatever, Banach's or somewhere, in some space with a lot of derivatives, and the equation is local in, in that space. Now, the generalizations that were done by divergent QED and particle physics suffer from the same uh, locality uh, in phase space, and they usually, not only they are enormous with 19 parameters, but they also lead to infinite equals to infinite plus 3 which is, whenever the theory does this, I would advise you to throw it out, start again, and start from something which is more complex, even though it doesn't look more complex, but you see, 
you shouldn't, the equations of variational aerodynamics are delay equations. Actually, they are neutral differential delay equations. A neutral equation is explained in my two, 2011 paper is an equation that uh, propagates a discontinuity. In variational aerodynamics, you get neutral equations and you have a condition at the discontinuity. So it's like a filter. Not every kind of discontinuity will be propagated. Only the ones that satisfy the virus as uh, conditions. We will see this a bit later. But in any case, an equation like this is more complex than an equation like this. So it is not reasonable to think that you are going to derive this from this. Okay? So if you are operating in this very narrow uh, two-level mentality, either classical or quantum, let me just tell you that this is above the quantum. Okay? It is more complex. You are not going to derive this one. Not from using Hamiltonians that do not exist and using li uh, local infinite dimensional problems. No, you're not. Okay? Just uh, something important to insist. Simplifications and details of epsilon VE are discussed next. But first, let me tell you my humble beginnings. I was playing uh, with uh, electrodynamics. In 1997, after playing with point charge electrodynamics in 1997, I could not develop any sensible model for the hydrogen atom. My tools included the Darwin-Lagrange and the Page series, Eliezer's theorem, and my knowledge of Hamiltonian ODEs then. Surprisingly, I could model helium with a low-velocity model, with two synchronized electrons and a stationary nucleus. Actually, it was a perturbed doubly circular Vanier orbit. My papers were about a perturbation of a circular orbit. The helium papers used the resonance for the Coulomb motion with uh, order V squared over C squared corrections up to which order the Lorentz Dirac theory and the Fokker action agree in the Darwin Lagrangian. At order V over C cubed, they separate. Lorentz Dirac equation has dissipation, while the Fokker action continues to be time reversible. A dangerous crossroads of two approaches. From the helium papers, it took me until 2013 to figure how to do hydrogen. I spent a long time working with the divergent uh, electrodynamics of Dirac, which suffers from the divergence, which is like QED. It was done by the same man in the beginning of the 20th century. They couldn't do better, and they were hiding the infinite in the parameters. And eventually I discovered that even if you assume that the infinite, uh, call it M, and try to work with the equation, it still does not, does not make sense. So at about 2008, I abandoned completely the Lorentz Dirac theory. Let me just tell you how you get equations of motion without diversion fields, which is variational electrodynamics. Wheeler and Feynman in 49 and, and 45, postulated an equation of motion with chi equals to zero, the parameter that I told you of the solution of the wave equation, satisfying the infinite dimension of quasi-variational principle of the Schwarzschild titro fokker action. These are the people in the beginning of the 20th century that discovered this was instrumental because Poincaré, for example, didn't know about this. They were this trying to do electrodynamics, and they failed. An enormous, a great, great mathematician failed in the beginning of the 20th century because this was a detail that came a bit after. Willard and Feynman's principle defines trajectory, which defines fields. And Maxwell's PDEs are solved automatically. So did you want a comprehensive theory that includes electromagnetism? Here you have it. Use 
the, the action of spark field. And the equations of motion are a sum of retarded and advanced fields. It is, uh, but the only problem with the equations of motion of Wheeler and Feynman, Wheeler and Feynman were not worried about infinites. In their days, infinites were normal, I think. People were just accepting uh, diversions. And, and their uh, action has integrals from minus infinity to plus infinity. Because I was living in a different time, and I was trying to put this in the computer, when I saw that you are going to integrate a function that doesn't vanish, and the limits of integration from minus infinity to plus infinity, say, no, the computer won't do this. It will be nonsense. It won't work with it. So I had to uh, go around it, and this, I will show you now the first time I had to change things and change the wheeler Feynman theory in many ways. So the first thing is to adapt it so that you don't have these infinite limits of integration. The same economic postulate of the wheeler Feynman action, corrected by Mr. De Luca, is generalizable with the action of Luis Martinez in, that was developed in 205, yielding epsilon VE, probably called the seven gentleman job by me, okay? which is Schwarzschild, Tetrode, Fokker, Wheeler, Feynman, Luis Martinez, and De Luca. Luis Martinez is just one guy. Uh, Schwarzschild is this German man with uh, a lot of consonants in his name. Uh, and this is a seven gentleman job. And there is room for one more. You can include non-zero G, and you can make it G epsilon V, and then it's finished. It's, it's the models that start to do, give you a problem, you have to do something else. Okay. My works with the theory of Wheeler and Feynman. Wheeler and Feynman rederived the Lorentz Dirac theory from an action at the distance theory using the variation of principle of Schwarzschild, Tintrode, and Fokker. The derivation makes several assumptions, as always. Uh, none of the above authors knew about the possibility of discontinuous velocity. They didn't know this. I started playing with this in 2010 when I saw something strange in a proof of... Uh, I was looking for a criterion and I found something Strange. And I figured that without assuming continuous velocities and expanding the delay, the derivation of Wheeler and Feynman does not reduce to the divergence Lorentz Dirac equation. After 2010, I reformulated the absorber condition in 2013 in order to estimate the boundary layer mechanism. Later, in 2019, I generalized the absorber condition to the chemical principle criterion, again to be used as a criterion. These are not needed if one has a semi-flow. I think now I can do better. Throw out the criterion and actually calculate the Bohr radius straight from variational electrodynamics using boundary layers. Let me just say, uh, show you how the partial Lagrangian of variational electrodynamics is after you correct wheeler feynman theory, which I did in 2009, 2013, 2016. You can put finite limits in the action of wheeler and feynman where this n is the unit vector that points from one particle to the other. If you look in my paper of 2013, there is a lot about atomic magnitudes and also about partial Lagrangians. And there is also this in my semi-flow paper. But, as I told you, it is not the principle of minimal action of classical mechanics. Because you, have, you need infinite dimensional information. You start from an initial point, just like the principle of minimal action, but you must have all the trajectory inside the light cone. So it's an infinite dimension of segment. You need the continuous positions, the velocities, and the accelerations. 
And then you have the final point of the other trajectory, but you must give this red segment inside the light cones for the other charge. So it is a boundary value variational problem. Very difficult, much harder than the Schrodinger equation. And, and so this is discussed in my 209 paper, and it, this is how you correct wheel of fundamental dynamics to make variational electrodynamics. Now, variational electrodynamics is calculus of variation instead of PDs. So you're rep replacing them. At points where the acceleration exists, you get the same euler lagrange equations as the minimizer condition, straight from Wheeler and Klein. Only that they were probably thinking that this is going to be an equation of motion just for the C infinity solution. But it's the same equation, which is the DDT of the variation of the momentum equals to the summation of the Lorentz force. If you generalize this for epsilon strong variation dynamics, there will be an epsilon term here in the same manner of at the vast. Uh, plus retarded summation. The electric field is again a semi-sum of advanced and retarded. And of course there is an advanced term sitting here that you have to solve for it. But this, these are the equations of motion. Epsilon V has the above time reversible differential delay equation of motion with neutral state dependent delay and Maxwell's PDEs are solved. You wanted to solve Maxwell's Unfortunately, it is a difficult infinite dimensional problem because, first of all, the interesting solutions have discontinuous velocities. And two, the breaking points are always inside boundary layers. The velocity discontinuities, which are the collision at the distance, they come inside the boundary layer where the velocity starts to be too large near the speed of light. So you have to go until near the speed of light to see a breaking point. The epsilon V has trajectories with discontinuous velocities caused by the collisions at the distance. So the remaining part of the Wheeler and Feynman equation of motion is at the breaking points because the, acid, the velocity is discontinuous at the breaking point. And if the velocity is discontinuous, you don't have an acceleration. You can't use the order of range equation. At those points, you have to use something else, which is, which is called the weierstrass erdmann uh, continuity condition. I abbreviate to VECC. So the VECC demands the continuity of the partial momenta and partial energies at the breaking point. So this is at points where your euler lagrange equation is not valid. These are expressible as delta pk equals to zero and delta ek equals to zero. And delta pk is the mechanical momentum plus something which I call the photonic momentum. It is mysterious in the divergent QED. So yeah, nobody told you about the Weierstrass Erdmann conditions before, so I'm saying it now. And the energy to be continuous is the mechanical energy plus this photonic energy. And these are four conditions for each particle. And whenever the velocity in the future, either future or past, tends to 1, you have that E photon tends to the, to the P photon, like the dream with the divergent QED. Okay. The VECC naturally involves a mechanical momentum and a mechanical energy, which is, I call it, photonic momentum and photonic energy. See, for example, 2013 in my papers after. Now, a question that I worked during the pandemics. Is electrodynamics a semi-flow? Let me give you a simplified time-reversible equation of motion by replacing a rank deficient linear form, the acceleration term of the Leonard Vischer 
potentials is a triple product which is linear in the acceleration but it is a linear form which is rank deficient because of the vector product so let me just say I ignore it for a second and I replace it by the acceleration just to see what happens and also ignore the velocity denominators just for now to, to explain things to you and, you know, and also I discard the near field I can keep everything but let's say we're going to do this then the equation of motion that you get is this m1a1 equals to 1 over the distance in line cone times the acceleration of the other particle in the future line cone plus 1 over the distance in the past line cone times the acceleration in the past line cone of the other particle well an equation like this of course it doesn't make much sense because it involves the future if you want to use an equation like this in a semi-flow, you can try to define a semi-flow if you rewrite this equation as an equation of motion for particle 2, like this, and you see this is an equation with two delays, okay? And this is a neutral differential delay equation with two delays, each satisfying Einstein locality. And of course the equation of motion of particle 1 has to be done from the equation of motion of particle 2, in the same manner. Back to the question, is electrodynamics a semi-flow? My semi-flow paper has the answer. If epsilon is non-zero, can be very small, but non-zero, epsilon VE can be a semi-flow on the set of continuous trajectories, possessing only two derivatives and no more derivatives. Okay? This is the nice thing about this uh, word. When you integrate delay equations, Electrodynamics, the Dirac theory, for example, you have to start from C infinity data, which is impossible. Here you can start from a C2 initial condition. Now I just wrote this, science has to correct itself, should be obvious. Only in a game to get prizes, which some people I think might be doing. An accept acceptable strategy is to go along with the supposedly prophetic generalizations of 20th century physics. Well, they are not prophets. They are people in trouble. We should actually correct them. Okay? And do simpler models. And try things that haven't been tried yet, of course. Let's review something very simple, I think. Review of bubble chamber trajectories with velocity discontinuity is most likely caused by collisions at the distance. Bubble chambers, you can Google bubble chamber, are filled with a superheated liquid and have plenty of atoms to get ionized because you have 23 atoms of your transparent superheated liquid. Still, the baby boomers treated the so-called positronic trajectory through the superheated transparent liquid as if it was in a vacuum. Vacuum? You, know, you have the superheated liquid. Uh, liquid there, just because it's uh, transparent it doesn't mean it's not there. Uh, perhaps the C infinity baby boomers did not know about velocity discontinuity. Certainly they didn't care for it. And collisions at the distance. So let me tell you what this is. Uh, this is uh, how my simple theory differs from uh, particle physics. Uh, First of all, your high f uh, in bubble chambers, you have a strong magnetic field which makes the causes the trajectories to curve, and you have a high frequency uh, source. And of course, the high frequency source is efficient to ionize atoms, we know that. Okay? And so, this is the job of the high frequency to ionize an electron from an atom of of the transparent liquid. This starts to gain energy from the oscillatory electromagnetic field and starts to rotate in the strong uh, magnetic field. And at some point it will collide with another electron at that distance. The elect there was an electron here at the corner bound to another atom and it will collide at the, at 
an atomic distance. So here you don't see the atomic distance. It will collide with this. Uh, and so this is a collision at the distance of two electrons. And this is a trajectory, which is just one trajectory. You don't need the positron here. You can have the same electron doing this. And I will explain to you simply why uh, you have um, that this is spiraling out and this is spiraling in. I was, uh, and it's also asymmetric. If it was a creation from vacuum, miraculous, with everything at symmetry, but this is not symmetric. You Google it. Okay? So spiraling out is frequent. Just. Uh, let me explain spiraling in right after a collision using a perturbation theory. The equation of motion is the force of the oscillatory field plus the force of the other atom. But then suppose I ignore it for most of the run. You are ignoring the, other, the, the force of the other atom. When you get close to it, the, the denominators you have to include because they have boundary layers. And you can play with an equation like this and transform it to an equation like this. DDT of the uh, energy is V times E. And of course, the VECC collision at the distance mechanism instantaneously changes V to minus V. It's the discontinuity. And if, you are sp if DDT was positive and you change V into minus V, it will be negative. It's not a surprise, right? That you, you are spiraling out and then you start to spiral in. So, collision at the distance is an application of electron V. Very simple. How do you do it? To integrate a problem like this, as I already told you, is a bit harder than integrating the Schrodinger equation because it's an infinite dimensional problem. You need histories for it. Okay? Because you see them at the distance and you see the uh, segment of history. So the initial history is, I suggest, the force one body trajectory before the breaking point for this electron. There was another electron here bound to an atom. Put an oscillatory segment for the electron bound to an atom near the breaking point. You won't see it because uh, in this picture, it is in the atomic magnitude, and the electron comes out like this. And you don't need this. So again, science has to correct and simplify itself. This application is what I call a double-barrel shotgun, killing two particles at once. The photon and the positron. You don't need the photon here, because you have a breaking point, and, and positron is the same electron. So, okay. Orbits with discontinuous velocities were unknown to the baby boomers, and certainly to generalists that read a single book in classical mechanics and live still today, and perhaps think that I'm doing classical mechanics. No, I'm not. Okay. Now, let me discuss a bit about boundary layers. The boundary layer is very sharp, for example, in my 2013, I have estimates of boundary layer, much like the boundary layer creating lift around an airplane's wing. You know, in the airplane, in the wing of the airplane, to get the lift, you have to have circulation, and actually, the large velocity of the fluid is in the boundary layer of you know, which is one one centimeter thick around the wings of the airplane. Everywhere else is small velocity. Okay. I have estimated the high frequency sharp tongue covering a 10 to the minus 6 fraction of the orbital period. It's super magnified here. So you have a low velocity two body orbit of the hydrogen atom. It is highly unstable. I will give you the references for it. And whenever the electron stabilizes, it falls into the proton and starts to acquire a large velocity. This is the boundary layer, magnified boundary layer. It will have, at some point, it will have a collision at the distance with the proton. Then it will come back up. Okay? You can see about this in my 2013 papers. I have estimated atomic magnitudes with it. Uh, in a two-electron atom, 
Now, if you have a two electron atom, it's even nicer because this is a hydrogen atom. If you have a two electron atom, the nucleus can continue its low velocity motion in the boundary layer. Because there are two electronic denominators to play with, so you can actually have the nucleus stationary even in, in the boundary layer. This is how I did my helium papers, right? Assuming that the nucleus was stationary, but I had two electrons to play with. That's why I was never able to do, and then when I had to do hydrogen with my helium model, it took me 15 years because of this. Okay. The PDE of the Luca 2019 was not derived by quantization. Again, just to tell you, by the same time. And epsilon VE is actually to replace QED. Much simpler. For example, read, if you want to read about QED in a Google with uh, Wikipedia, there is all the sentences that Dirac said about it and all the important scientists of the 20th century hear about renormalization. They were not happy uh, with the infinites and Perhaps they forgot to say, and are you happy with the 19 parameters, or what about you just one parameter and many things? Epsilon VE comprehensively contains a sensible version of Maxwell's set when I, you can see it here. Moreover, Epsilon VE includes continuous trajectories with discontinuous velocities and boundary layers. In my 2019 paper, I derived the Schrodinger equation with a Bohr radius depending on the boundary layer, which I estimated using a criterion. I am still going to give a complete derivation straight from variational dynamics. It's hard to calculate the boundary layer. Okay? My semi-flow paper delivers something the beginning of the 20th century lacked. No. A time reversible equation of motion in semi flow form for electrodynamics. They didn't have it. It was, was uh, with the diver uh, divergent Lorentz Dirac equation. Okay, I hope to have engaged you to read my works now. It was just an appetizer, okay, to engage you. And I thank you. Now, let me just overview the references pretty quick. Schwarzschild, Hugo Tetrault, and, and Fokker are the people that discovered the variational principle in the beginning of the tw early 20th century. Kiri, Jordan, and Sudarshan proved the relativistic environment and, ha and Hamiltonian theories of interacting particles. Then Mar uh, Sudarshan again with Marmo proved the Lagrangian version of the no-interaction theorem. It's important to know this. And then Wheeler and Feynman started variational dynamics using the action of these guys. Alfred Shield was actually trying to make a model for the neutron using action at the distance electrodynamics and failed. And this is one of the most important scientists of the 20th century, the only one that corrected Albert Einstein in 1963. Anderson and von Bayer studied the instability of the circular orbits of Wheeler Feynman electrodynamics. This is a book where you can see the, uh, the energy fusion uh, electric fields. John Legat Martin is the relativity book that I mentioned about uh, this, uh, doing the theory of relativity a la Hermann Bondi. Very nice for people studying delay, state dependent delay. Domingo Luis Martinez is the one that generalized the Wheeler Feynman action. Now to my papers. My helium papers are here. The, Luca, the variational principle I started in 2009. It was the beginning of uh, variational electrodynamics. This is when I started to figure that I would need this continuous velocity in 2010, but I was not completely sure about things. And 
time I was writing papers uh, to tell the physicists about uh, delay equations, and this is a paper and that has an appendix explaining what a neutral differential delay equation is. Of course, in this paper I failed to tell people that this is not a special case of quantum mechanics. So I told you now. Variational electrodynamics of atoms is when I was more into the depths of variational dynamics. This is a paper, like a mathematical paper, when I still didn't know that I would, that I was going to be able to integrate the equations forward. I was still thinking that I was going, uh, that I had a boundary value problem. And this is a derivation of a Schrodinger equation, but when it came to do the boundary layer, I had to use a criterion because I couldn't do the boundary layer. And then my semi-flow paper, which is out now, and that's all.